have uh, Dr. Susan Lee uh, to present uh, today's lecture entitled Unhealthy and Unsheltered, the Health Status of Homeless Veterans. So uh, be very excited to welcome her and also be very excited uh, to see you tonight. Again, this is, you're going to have a lot of uh, information and it can be very, very informative and impactful lecture. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, also, we are very excited to see a board of member among us. Uh, Sir Fred Rashke is here, uh, so thank you for coming, and uh, we appreciate that. And again, welcome all of you. Um, I have asked uh, uh, Kelly Pennell to say a few words about uh, today's presenter. So please. on the Veterans Administration Advisory Committee for Homeless Veterans in Washington, D.C., advising the President of the United States and Congress on policies to prevent homelessness and improve outcomes of veterans. She's dedicated to improving health outcomes for underserved populations and champions improving global health outcomes. The other uh, part of her research foci is the focus, I should say, is on improving nursing education, and she, her specialty is concept-based curriculum. She served on the Board of Nursing and many other great accomplishments, so welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to see y'all here tonight. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'm not used to being tethered, but I'm going to be tethered tonight because I need my notes to give you all the statistics that I'm going to give you. Um, I want to know how many of you are veterans. I know some of you have already told me that you're veterans. So how many of you are veterans? Stand up. Come on, stand up. Okay. Thank you for your service. <laughs> so I jokingly, not really, tell people, don't ask me about homelessness unless you really want to hear about homelessness. Because once you get me started, it's hard for me to stop talking because it is such an important issue. And I've got many, many stories. So in amongst the information I'm gonna give you, the data and the kind of shocking, boring, unfortunate things, I'm gonna give you real life stories. So um, I, know, I know you're probably wondering what made me go into this field looking at, at homelessness and how I got started with it. I lived in Port Aransas, which you guys should be able to relate to Port Aransas. It's probably very similar to Galveston. Very temperate climate, population of 3,000. I worked in Corpus Christi at uh, the Del Mar College and at the um, um, A&M Corpus Christi. And in their schools of nursing. But as I would go to work over the JFK Causeway, I would see people crawling out from under the houses on stilts or the buildings on stilts. And I would see them climbing out of the dry docked boats. And I started wondering about that because unless you are looking for homeless people, you don't necessarily see them. But once you see them, you see them and you always see them. And so I started wondering, uh, what, why, why were there so many homeless people? And I realized that with the temperate climate that we, that we had in Port Aransas, and with a small community that was willing to support people who were less fortunate. I mean, we had the less fortunate supporting the lesser fortunate in Port Aransas. And they would all come together to help. Whatever they had, they would give. And that's what the homeless do. Whatever they have, they will give. So um, one day I was at home. I had company from out of town. I often had company from out of town because after all, I lived at the beach. Who, who wouldn't want to go to Port Aransas, right? 
So I got a call from one of the bar owners, and he said, please come down. There's a guy who is living underneath the VFW. Please come down and take a look at him. I'm really worried about him. So I went over and I took a look. I, I walked up with the bar owner, and the man was sitting on one of those aluminum beach chairs, the long ones, the lounging chairs with the webbing. You guys get a picture of that? He was laying on that. That's where he slept under the VFW. <clears throat> Around him were some wrappers from food. So people had been bringing him food, and probably not really nutritious, but it was at least food. And then he had a lot of paper books because he was an avid reader. But as I walked up, I noticed he was gray, literally gray, and he was struggling to breathe. So I sat down on the floor next to him, on the ground next to him, trying to figure out how I was going to get him to a hospital. And he, uh, as I was talking to him, the bar owner leaned down and he whispered in my ear and he said, Susan, Victor said he will do anything you decide he needs to do. And I said, then you need to call 911 right now. And so he went off to, count, to call. So people started congregating, as people do, and they knew that Victor was living under the VFW, so they knew it had to be Victor, and so they were curious and they wanted to know what was going on. So here they come, and, and I said to the bar owner, I said, what is taking this ambulance so long? I have heard this ambulance go by six times. And he said, yes, they keep driving, driving by the VFW. The VFW is on one of the main streets in Port Aransas. It's on, it's on McAllister Street. How they were missing the VFW was beyond me. I said, get, get these people out. And have them stop. Have them stop the ambulance. And so they did. They got the ambulance stopped. They got the people, the workers on the ambulance. And I don't know if it was a paramedic, whether she was an EMT or an EMS. I, I, she wasn't my focus. But she came walking up, and she looked at Victor with complete disdain and disgust on her face. And she said, he has bugs in the sores on his feet. And I was so offended by that because my thought was he has, he has a mama, he has a family, he may have bugs, but why treat him this way when he is so critically ill? She put the PO2 on his finger and that measures oxygen levels. We hope it's about 98, 99 or 100. His was in the low 80s, which becomes very critical for sustaining life. And so, so he got transferred to the hospital in Aransas Pass. He was there a short while before he was transported to the VA hospital in, I think in Temple. Um, he came back a few, a few months later and he was healthy again. He didn't remember me, he didn't, which was fine, I didn't have any problem with that because then I could watch him and I could observe him and I could see that the community had again come to his support and assistance. They, they found him a place to live. He didn't like living inside, so they switched it to a tent. He liked living in a tent. And he got a job, and so I got to see him every now and then um, in one of the bars where he was working. He lived a few more years after that, and then he died. That's why I can tell you so much about him, because he's no longer with us. Um, he, he gave the paramedic his age, and I was shocked to learn that he was only two years older than I was. He looked every bit of 30 years older than I, than I was. And that's what homelessness does. It's a hard, hard life, y'all. And so somebody needs to advocate for the homeless. I, because he was a Vietnam veteran and because in Port Aransas there were so many Vietnam veterans, there were also a lot of Korea, Korean War veterans. But because of that, my focus, my initial focus was on Vietnam veterans. So, so while I'll talk about other veterans as well, I'm going to talk mostly about Vietnam veterans.
So no conflict of interest. I, I don't have any company that's supporting me on this. This is my own thing. So some of the objectives tonight are to um, describe the state of homelessness for military veterans, define veteran homelessness, analyze the factors that contribute to veteran homelessness, explore how the VA, Veterans Administration, and community programs respond to the needs of homeless veterans, and understand the decision-making process used by homeless veterans in accessing health care, recognize the unique health care needs of homeless veterans. You'll hear me speak about Vietnam veterans. Um, because like I said, that's the one that I started with, but this is gonna be general homelessness for veterans. Nearly half of homeless veterans served during Vietnam, with one third of those serving in combat. 1.4 million veterans are at risk of becoming homeless because of poverty, lack of social support, overcrowded, substandard housing, and incarceration. One in five or 20% of homeless veterans are males, and one in 11 or 9% are females. Despite these risks and due to the diligence and significant efforts on the part of the Veterans Administration and Congress, we have successfully decreased the numbers of veteran homelessness. The Housing and Urban, De Urban Development defines a homeless person as someone who does not have a regular adequate nighttime residents. Veterans are classified as homeless when any VA homeless services are accessed. When veterans are assigned an international classification of diseases, lack of housing code, or when they receive any specialty bed section code designated by the VA for homeless veterans, they are then considered homeless. But veterans are not identified as homeless during the first year. Y'all, during the first year that they are homeless, they are not classified by the VA as being homeless. It's not until they go into the second year that they are counted as homeless, and that is after the PIP count, the point in time count that is done every January. People go out, and it's not an ideal situation, but they go out every January, and they go to the camps, they go in twos and threes, because for safety, you, have, you cannot go alone. So they go to the homeless camps in the middle of the night, and they start interviewing and counting as many as they can find. Sometimes they get duplication, but that's okay. It's not a whole lot. But they do, they do do a point in time count in January. It's a great thing if you ever want to volunteer for it. It's a much needed service to your community. Um, more, most, most communities, several communities and several states now have reported effectively ending veteran homelessness. I want y'all to know what effectively ending veteran homelessness means because it's a way for communities to say, yes, we've ended homelessness. No, that's not what they're saying. They're saying we have placed people who want to be placed in housing. We still have homeless people who do not want to be placed. Now, I've had people want to argue with me about that. Why would anybody not want to be placed in a house? There are people who don't want to be placed, who find that the community aspect of homelessness, the living in the camps, the watching out for each other, that camaraderie that they, that they got in the military, they get again in these communities. You put them in a house where they're living all by themselves, they're lonely, they don't have their resources. So, so, um, so that's the difference between functional zero and, and placing, placing veterans. So the, the official um, definition is that you can only have three or less people showing up per day who are not wanting to be placed. If you have more than three, then you do not have functional zero anymore. <clears throat> half of homeless veterans have physical disabilities, half have, have serious mental illnesses, 
70% have substance use problems, including illegal drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, cannabis. African Americans account for 10% of the U.S. veteran population, and 3% identify as Hispanic. Of the veteran adult males, 57% are white, and 45% are African American or Hispanic. I'm going to talk some about the Veterans Administration, and as Dr. Pinnell said, I served on the advisory committee for homeless veterans for the VA advising the President and Congress from 2017 to 2021. When you hear me talk about the VA, I'm going to tell you some of the problems that they're having. I am not bashing the VA. I've had people come up to me and say, you are bashing the VA. I am not bashing the VA. If you don't like what, what is being said, it's because we need to change things, but change comes very slowly. But I am totally supportive of the VA. Interestingly enough, in all my work with veterans, veterans are, can be split right down the middle of wanting of whether they will go to the VA or whether they absolutely refuse to go. There's no middle ground. Yes, they'll go, no, they won't. And, and in every study I did, it came right down the middle. It just worked out that way, that they either went or they, or they would not go. And they had their reasons for not going. Somebody died with Agent or Orange in Vietnam. Somebody, somebody else was not treated right, whatever. So, they, so, so the Veterans Administration does a lot of good work, but they also have, need, need some work on some other things. At the VA, homeless programs are more reactive and situation, and situation focused and preventative. So they're not working to stop or prevent homelessness. But once somebody is homeless, they'll work to try to place them again in a house or in a job. More than 40,000 homeless veterans receive compensation or pension benefits each month from the VA. And many of them, many of the, the people who are homeless are receiving pension benefits. They just need to have an address to have the pension benefits mailed to or a bank account to have them deposited into. Just because they're, they're, they're homeless doesn't mean that they're not getting money because they are. The VA, the HUD, and the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is the USICH up there, share a common mission to ensure veterans are provided with resources and assistance to prevent homelessness, to rehabilitate and reintegrate into society, by providing immediate and long-term assistance to facilitate the return to civilian life. The Housing First model facilitates rapid placing, placement into permanent supportive housing. During my service with the Advisory Committee for Homeless Veterans, I learned that the VA can only com accommodate about half of the veterans who are in the United States. So it's probably a good thing only half of them will go. But they've got aging facilities. Their infrastructures are, are falling apart. Yes, they are building new facilities, but they can't keep up with the rate that they need to be keeping up with them. Um, the other thing that, that causes a problem with veterans is that when they are in the service, when they're in active duty, they are under the Department of Defense. The day they separate from the military, from active duty, they are now under Veterans Health Administration and the Veterans Administration. And we need to, the Veterans Administration needs to do a better job of educating service people before they leave, while they're still under the DOD, about what is available to them. They have, within the, the service person's last year of service under the DOD, they are now given tons of materials, teaching them, educating them about VA benefits. They have to complete all of these assignments before they can leave the military. Now, y'all, how many times have you had some big event happening like leaving the military, big, big event, and you were excited about it. You were excited about it, weren't you? You're looking forward to it. 
You know that the big day is coming, but you've got to jump through these hoops. You just do it as quickly as you can. Just goal-oriented to get them done. And then you land on the other side and you go, oh, maybe I should have paid attention to what they were teaching me. And that happens a lot. One of the problems with, with homeless services, one of the problems, oh, well, let's go through the risks of homelessness. Um, if you, if you look at the psychosocial risks, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorders, and incarceration, and then there's a transition to civilian life. Think about being in the military, going to boot camp, going to a foreign country, boots on the ground, landing there when you're 18 years old. This is what happened to Vietnam veterans. Landing there when they were 18 years old and had no idea what they were about to get into. I had one, one Vietnam veteran share with me that he enlisted when he was 18. He had, he had not graduated from high school. In my initial study, all but one of my participants had, en had enlisted while they were in high school. They joked that going to Vietnam was their senior fling, their senior party. It was no party to hear them talk about this. But they were put in a room, and somebody came into the room and said, who's related to anybody in the national government? OK, y'all can leave. Who's related to anybody in the state government? Yeah, now, y'all can leave. And they went down through at the local county, city levels, until they just had a few people left. And they said, okay, you guys come with us. You're gonna be put with the big guns at the front of the troops when you go into war. Now, if that doesn't tell you that you're expendable, it's, it was really sad to hear that story. Um, so when, when people join the military, they go to boot camp, they do trainings, they're trained for something very specific in the military. That does not necessarily transition to civilian life. One, one man told me that he was trained to drive a, a tank. I don't see any tra tanks driving down the streets of Houston. I live in Austin, they're not there either, by the way. But they were, were not given any kind of training, any vocational education to be able to transition into life back home. Another, another problem with the post-traumatic stress disorder, Vietnam veterans were told that it was shameful, it was a sign of weakness to admit that you had post-traumatic stress disorder. Fortunately, we did better with our most, with our more recent uh, wars, and we treated our soldiers better and we told them that it was okay if they came back with post-traumatic stress disorder. In the Operation Iraqi Freedom, for instance, those guys, those men and women, were being sent back multiple times, not just you're one and done and you come back and you can do whatever. They were being sent back for a year or 18 months and then brought home for three to six months and then turn around and go back out and fight again. And that is horrible on your psyche. Then try to, try to um, integrate back into your family life. When you've been gone that long, things have changed and the dynamics of the family have changed. The veteran, the, the serviceman has also changed, or woman, because they've been taught to fight. If they are being being approached in a, in a fighting stance, they are taught to fight back and to protect their friends. So they get home and then their family starts fighting with them. It's all they can do to tamper down that training that they've had to not lash out at their family. It ends up in the dissolution of a family. 
it ends up with the home breaking apart, it ends up with the service man or woman being homeless. I gotta go back, I think I skipped a slide. You, you, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, good. Other than honorable discharge, did y'all know that there was such a thing? Other than honorable. Eligibility for VA benefits is based upon discharge from active military service under honorable or general conditions. 25% of homeless veterans have other than honorable discharges. Currently, other than honorable discharge veterans are eligible for benefits, such as supportive services for veteran families, grant per diem, and the Department of Labor Veterans Employment and Training Service. But they are still not eligible for VA supportive housing or health care. Health care is probably the number one thing that homeless veterans need the most. And by the way, health care does not include dental care. The VA doesn't, doesn't cover dental care for, for the homeless people that they provide services to. And that can be extremely painful. Veterans with other than honorable discharges can apply for a discharge upgrade, which may result if the discharge was related to mental health conditions or military sexual trauma or sexual orientation, such as from the dumbass, don't tell, period. When the veteran's discharge is updated, a DD-21 is issued, showing corrections to the DD-214. The DD-214 is a certificate of discharge from the military. Every person who has been discharged from the military has a DD-214. If you ask a homeless person if they were in the military and you're not sure if they were or not, first of all, don't ask them a specific war. I learned from Victor, don't walk up to somebody and say, did you serve in the Vietnam War? because they probably didn't, they probably served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and they just looked 30 years older than they were. But if you go up to a homeless person and you ask them if they have a DD-214, whether they have it or not, they know what it is. And if they don't have it, it's an opportunity for somebody to help them get it back. Because when you are homeless, you live with everything on your back. I was called out one time to go see a man who, uh, who a contact that I had who would call me when he was concerned about somebody who was homeless. He worked for the Catholic Church and he went out and visited the homeless frequently and he would call me. So he called me and he said, I want you to come check this guy. I think that he's got probably blood pressure problems and I'm not sure if he's taking his medication. So I go up and it's a hot summer day in Austin. I'm sweating, I'm standing out there on it in the intersection on that island with this man and and I said well let's go over here to the side of the street so so we did we went over to the corner and I said I need to check your blood pressure he started undressing every piece of clothing he owned was on his body and it was like peeling an onion and I thought he looked pretty healthy pretty sturdy until he got all of his clothes off and he was very very thin he just looked heavier because he had everything. They carry everything on their body, in their backpack, and they do not let that go. That doesn't mean that it's not taken away from them. It doesn't mean that they don't lose it. And so if they lose their DD-214, which does happen, they can get those replaced. They just need to get to the VA to get a replacement. And then they need to have a mailbox, some kind of mailing address. In Austin, we can mail, homeless people can, can use the shelter, the homeless shelter in downtown Austin. They have a mail room specifically for that reason. So that, so that when they go to apply for a job and they need a mailing address, there it is. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people recognize the PO number, but still, they have an address that they can have things mailed to. Although there's an overwhelming amount of information and support for separating service members, choosing to receive VA benefits is seen as a sign of weakness for many veterans. So how did I get started? So with Victor, like I said, I was wondering what the decision-making process was when I looked around at all those veterans, those homeless veterans, why did they decide not to access healthcare when they had it? They
They earned this benefit. They, they gave their, their all for this benefit to be taken care of for the rest of their lives. And yet they wouldn't access it. And so I started wondering about that. What is the decision-making process? So I, I decided to conduct a grounded study, a grounded methods study. Um, I developed a grounded theory, and I have since tested it, and it absolutely works. But, now this might get a little tedious, but hang with me here, because this is really, to me, this is fascinating. The philosophical, the methodological, uh, the philosophical theory behind this, this grounded theory is symbolic interactionism. Now let me tell you, I had to watch a lot of YouTubes and read a lot of books to finally grasp symbolic interactionism. But once I got it, I think every healthcare professional should take a course in symbolic interactionism because it applies across all healthcare professions and it, it applies to everybody who, who comes in as a patient. But this symbolic interactionism is, uh, is where people respond to things based on the meaning that things have for them. For instance, there are three truths to every situation. Did y'all know that? Three truths. There's my truth of what happened. There's Dr. Caldwell's truth, truth of what happened. Then there's what really happened, because he and I have interpreted interpreted this different ways, but then there's what really happened. Um, it can also be applied to the three me's, who I think I am, who you think I am, who I really am. <clears throat> For veterans, including those who are homeless, status and rank have meaning, and they are associated with levels of respect for what these men and women have done. And they deserve that respect from all of us. Now, Vietnam veterans did not get that respect when they came back from fighting. The political climate was horrible, and the American people blamed the soldiers, which was putting the blame in the wrong place. Fortunately, we learned from catastrophic events that occurred as a result of that, and we treat our soldiers better now. We make it a point to treat them better. Among healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, social workers and therapists may be included and be assigned professional status while delivering healthcare, while giving their diagnoses, while deciding what treatment is, is needed, and their prognoses. It's their white coats, it's their stethoscopes, it's their name badges, it's everything that designates them as being a healthcare professional. And then by virtue of that, they get rank and meaning, they get status. That is symbolic interactionism. Did y'all ever watch Patch Adams? Yeah, those of us who are older watched Patch Adams. Robin Williams, go watch it, you'll love it. Robin Williams uh, portrayed Patch Adams, who was a real life doctor. But in one of the scenes, Patch Adams goes in to a, a beef conference where they're all wearing the butcher coats, right? The long white butcher coats, and he gets one, and he is, just because he puts it on, he's, he's recognized as being a member of this meat conference, which he was not, he was a medical student. But he takes that coat, and he goes back to the hospital where he's a medical student, and now all of a sudden he's a doctor because he's got that coat on. That's symbolic interactionism. You see it, you associate it with something, and your mind will always take you back to that. And you will, you will give that person the status and the rank that you think goes along with whatever it is that you're seeing in those symbols. Um, so one of my examples of this is uh, if somebody is a drill sergeant or a corporal, drill sergeants, boy, people step up and they pay attention to drill sergeants. I was in, back in Port Aransas, I was in a bar one evening, a 
And a friend of mine who was probably 98 pounds dripping wet, Vietnam veteran, had served 27 years in the military, um, was sitting there talking to me. And a bar, a bar fight broke out. Imagine that. A bar fight broke out. And Van jumped up and he grabbed one of the men. The men were easily twice, three times his size. They could have just flung him off, him off and off. But Van grabbed one of the guys from behind, right around his chest, and he said, stand down, Marine. Fight was over. They stopped. They walked out. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I didn't think, I mean, I, I had a lot of respect for my friend, but I didn't realize that he had that kind of authority, but he did, he did. Um, it's important for, to the individual to be part of a social interaction and be seen as playing a part or having a role, such as mine had uh, arisen from the military experience. Returning home as a hero or fulfilling the leadership role in a combat mission. These self-perceptions motivate behavior. After being in the military and possibly in a leadership, that's not me, in a leadership position, <laughs> Being homeless and possibly ill may cause the veteran to feel vulnerable and powerless. As homeless Vietnam veterans age and become more vulnerable, they have greater health care needs. There's a hierarchy in the military that's carried forward and respected long after veterans return to the United States, and the example of Van is just that. Um, they need to be seen. It's important for veterans to be seen as men and women who have given to their country, who have earned, who have earned that right to have respect. And sometimes they don't get it. Sometimes they, they don't get it at the VA when they go for health care, particularly when they show up for an appointment and somehow the appointment has been canceled. When I lived in Port Aransas, there were many, many, many veterans there from all wars. They knew that I worked close to the VA. And so they would contact me and ask me to drive them to the clinic. I did many, many, many times. It was fascinating to listen to their stories. But the deal was, was that I was going to work at 7, 7.30 in the morning. And it was across town. It was not only not in Port Aransas, but it was on the north side of Corpus Christi. And so I would tell them where I worked. I would drop them off at 7.30, and I'd say, I'll come back and get you at 5 o'clock. Sometimes during the day, they would catch the bus, and they would go to Walmart, or they would go somewhere else, and they'd go shopping. So on the ride back home, they'd show me what they bought, underwear, socks, candy. And they'd say, you want some candy? I got candy. I got candy. You got to have candy. People who are homeless don't have much, but they share it, and they want you to partake. So it was important to the people who I was taking to the clinic that they were able to give me something. It might just be one piece of candy, and one piece of candy that I really didn't want, but I always took it. With the healthcare utilization theory, there were some things, all of these are concepts that contributed to the healthcare decision making model. One of the big ones was their military experiences. Well, military history is military history. You can't change that. Deal with it. It's there. It's there. We need to provide whatever we need to provide to help you get past that military history because we cannot change that. The other thing was their substance use. All of the initial um, participants in my initial study said that they had not been using alcohol or substances before they got into the military. It was when they landed in Vietnam. They landed in Vietnam with a pack, a first aid pack on their back. And in that first aid pack was four milligrams of morphine that was meant to be used in an emergency situation where one of your comrades has gotten injured to help them alleviate the pain. It wasn't used that way. 
the horrors that they felt and experienced when they had boots on the ground in Vietnam at 18 years of age were so great that they started using. And it was so bad that in, in different uh, branches of the military and in, in different areas, it, before somebody was sent back home, they were sent to treatment and they were dried out and gotten off of the drugs that they were on before they were sent home. Not all of them, not all of them. Some of them just came home addicted. And, and the addiction just continued um, once they got home because of the difficulties they were having reintegrating into society. Within homelessness, something very interesting happens. They have camaraderie. Like I said earlier, they look out for each other. They help each other. They may fight with each other. They may hate each other, but they look out for each other. I was called to, uh, to assess a guy one time, and there were several people that it was not a camp. I've never been into any of the camps because they're not safe for me. So, so I was in this big field, and I sat down, and people started coming up and sitting down, and we made this big circle. But the guy that I was called to come see was like a wounded animal. He would pace outside the circle, and then he would come forward, and I think, okay, he's going to come join us, and then he'd turn around and go back out. When they go out and they panhandle on the street corners, that's called flying their signs. So when they've got their cardboard sign, they're out there flying their signs. I learned with the homeless that they do that until they get what they need. Now, I want you all to stop and think about this just a minute. If that was you and you were going out there on that, on that corner and you were panhandling, how much do you need? What do you need? they would go out and they would get just what they needed and then they would come in because then somebody else could go out and get what they needed. I think, I hate to say it, but I think I'd probably be out there eight hours trying to get as much as I could, but maybe not. Maybe I would learn better from these people in their communities. So, so he he finally came, this guy that I was supposed to go out and assess, he finally came, he had been out flying his sign, he had gone to the ice house, he had gotten a tall boy beer, he had gotten a pack of cigarettes. That's what he needed. He came in, he sat down, and the first thing he did was he opened up the pack of cigarettes, he took one out, he lit it, and he passed the rest of the pack around. And all the smokers in the circle took a cigarette. Came back around, he finished his cigarette, he pulled out another one, and the pack went around. And it kept going until the pack was empty. Same thing happened with the beer. So he had one beer, he had 20 cigarettes, and he shared them with anybody who wanted it. I'm telling you, the homeless want to share. I was, I was working at the board in downtown Austin one day, for years I did. One day I, I rode the bus to and from home because downtown Austin traffic is as bad as downtown Houston traffic. So I'm sitting there waiting for the bus and this guy was walking up and down the sidewalk and I'm smiling because he was so entertaining and he, he didn't have a shirt on, he didn't have shoes on, he barely had his pants on and he didn't have underwear but he had, he had pants and he had a little can like a tuna fish can and he had a piece of paper that just fit into the tuna fish can. And he was walking up and down the street and he'd say, hey mama, you got a cigarette? You got a dollar? How about a quarter? How about, how about I give you a dollar for four quarters? You, want a, you got a dime? You want a dime? And he'd just talking, talking about it. And the people, watching the people was as entertaining for me as watching him. He finally comes over and he sits down beside me and he said, what do you need? I said, I don't, I don't need anything. I said, are you waiting for the bus? He said, I'm waiting for the bus, but they won't let me get on because I ain't got no shoes. Said, okay, we have standards in Austin. You can't ride the bus. You can't ride the public bus unless you have shoes. But in Austin, you can ride the bus for free if you're homeless. 
which, uh, which many, many of the homeless people do ride the bus. But they've got to have their shoes on. So, so as we're sitting there talking, he takes the piece of paper off the can and he offers it to me. And it's full of money. It's full of the green folding, soothing kind. It's full of coins. It's full of... So he had money. He said, take what you need. I said, I don't need, I don't need anything. Thanks. He said, but you don't have any money. Well, that was true. I didn't have any money because I have to stop carrying cash because I will give every penny in my pocket to the homeless. And so I, I stopped and I started carrying things that I could give to them. Protein bars. They don't always appreciate protein bars. They don't always appreciate water. They don't always appreciate sunscreen or, or chapstick. But those are the things that I carry and that I offer to them. I will tell you that I understand if I were homeless, I would probably want to be drunk every minute of the day, just like they are, especially as a woman, because I would feel very, very, very threatened by it. But, but he, he was very entertaining and I enjoyed talking to him. Um, the homeless, probably don't think it's because of Kelly. <laughs> the homeless have their own communication system. They don't go to the doctor because they have a, an illness that needs quality care. They need to find a doctor who will give them what they need. For instance, if they have a rotted tooth that they are having extreme pain from and they try to go to the doctor to get narcotics, they're not gonna get them. The most they're gonna get is Tylenol or Advil. But if they talk to one of their people who live in the camp with them, then the, those people will tell them, this is who you need to go to. This is the most, the most willing doctor or nurse practitioner to help you. And so I call that, I heard it through, through the grapevine. They also had access issues. The access issues were not something that, that, that they could deal with in their communities. And that's why it's up at the top. Access issues meant that they might have had problems, their own mobility problems. They might have had a fractured hip or a hip replacement. They might have had knee problems. They couldn't get around. They couldn't walk so well. They might have had a walker or whatever. And so, so those are access issues. And then getting to the VA. The VA isn't always convenient for them. we got to talk about COVID. Uh, no time short. So we'll go through this really quick. Veteran unemployment rose during COVID. That's not surprising. 17% um, of the, the homeless then were, um, were from Vietnam. Female veterans, 14% filed for unemployment. Uh, altogether, 1 million veterans in 2020 filed for jobless benefits. Um, there are some programs, the Homeless Veterans Community Employment Services will work with veterans for vocational assistance, job development, placement, and ongoing supports to improve um, employment. The Compensated Work Therapy is another job placement program to assist homeless veterans to return to the workforce. And the Vocational Rehab and Employment Program helps veterans with building employment services so that they can get hired for a job. We're fortunate in this country to have something called street medicine where where healthcare professionals go out into the street to where the homeless are to provide health care for them. Um, there are several different um, initiatives. The VA has an initiative called the Anywhere to Anywhere program. It provides access to telehealth where homeless veterans might have limited internet access, so it provides them with internet access. The accessing telehealth through local area stations is called the Atlas program. It offers health care virtual appointments, telehealth appointments for primary care, nutrition, mental health, uh, counseling, and social work services. And then there's also the VA Video Connect, which the VA has started using with veterans of foreign wars um, to provide a place for veterans to go, homeless veterans to go and have a private place to have a telehealth appointment. So, in conclusion, Community-based, nonprofit veteran peer support groups offering transitional housing, a sense of community, and 
camaraderie and structured substance-free environments with fellow veterans seems to be the most effective for homeless and at-risk veterans. Government funding is limited and services are often stretched to, to their capacity. Community groups provide additional support, resources, and opportunities such as housing, employment, and health care. And until the root problems are addressed, homelessness will continue to be an issue. Two words that should never be used together. Veteran, homelessness, never. And we are all one major medical event away from being homeless. I have seen many, many people who had a job, who had, who had a major medical issue, or their spouse died and they ended up homeless. So don't think it won't happen to somebody that you know. And let's just be better at it. Anyway, thank you. Um, do we have time left over for questions? Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. regards. Yes, okay. we do. We still have seven, okay. ten minutes, so please. Anybody would like to ask questions? So if anybody has any questions, you can, we're small enough that you can just ask them. I think I can hear them up here. And I won't have to do the PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pinnell's laughing at me. Um, I have business cards up here. If y'all want to take my business card in case you might want to contact me later, you know, like I said at the beginning, I, I love talking about homelessness. Do you have a question? No, he's just pointing at me. I'm okay. Busy. Okay, it looked like. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I'd like to ask the question in general, like uh, homelessness, and uh, what percentage would be veterans? You know, like is there is any numbers out there? Or just there, there are. It actually, it's a it's sad. It's almost sixty percent of veterans. Sixty percent. Wow. So that's, that's, that's it's right. really it's really sad how many are veterans. Yes. It's a big number. Um, you said funding, you said you got government funding is like limited, but so what's being done to address this issue? Because there's the, as a veteran, I know a lot of this stuff. There's this and there's and there's the suicide issue. Those, those are like two big things. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I did not, I did not tell him to ask that. <laughs> In 2017, up until 2017, homelessness, Veteran homelessness was on the president's top five list of priorities. And we had been making steady decreases in the numbers of veteran homelessness cases because we were actively working to place veterans. In 2017, veteran homelessness was removed from that list and replaced with suicide prevention. Now I agree, suicide prevention is a major issue. But our concern on the Advisory Committee for Homeless Veterans that advised the President and advised Congress, would, we were very concerned that we were going to start sliding back and veteran homelessness was going to start increasing again. So I started arguing every time I went to a meeting, I said, we need to combine the two. They go hand in hand. If somebody is, is homeless, they might be thinking about suicide and vice versa. Because of their mental issues and their suicidal ideation, they might become homeless. We can address these two together. It took me four years before it was added back, but it has been added back. And so, so with the VA, with HUD, with the United States, um, the UH, USICH, the council, there are lots of communities, I mean, lots of councils, lots of government agencies that are working to address veteran homelessness. We also need to be addressing you know, the general population homelessness. And it's through programs, research programs, that people are conducting, like what I conducted, to develop a theory about why they don't access it. If we understand why they won't go to access healthcare, maybe we can overcome that and get them to go get the benefits that they earn. So that's a great question, thanks.
say local or global? Local, like working with the city to address issues of homelessness. There are, <clears throat> that's, that's another great question. So y'all have great questions. Something I didn't talk about is that communities have come together through the VA and not through the VA um, to provide housing for veterans. Um, for the for the communities, I'll get specific. For the communities that don't necessarily aren't necessarily uh, government funded, like they might be private funded, then it's for all of the homeless population. And I'm going to give you examples of them. In Nashua, uh, North uh, New Hampshire, there is a, a homeless community. It's it's part of the VA, and it is a fabulous community, and they have been in existence probably 40, 30, 40 years now, and they're one of the communities who have claimed to have effectively ended homelessness. They have, they saw, they're, they're a small, Nashua is a small town, probably, well, it's bigger than Port Aransas, um, maybe about the size of Galveston. I think Galveston, what's the population of that? Okay, yeah, so maybe maybe more. But they got a lot of the the, the leader of that of that um, initiative had a lot of great insight. And so he got a lot of big industry to donate money. And then he looked around at all the empty buildings. San Francisco is doing this too. Looked around at all the empty buildings and used that donated money to buy these buildings, to convert them into housing, into residences. And they got very creative. One of the buildings I went into, the apartments had a bedroom, a bathroom, might have had one other, I don't remember it, but they were small. You didn't hear me say kitchen because they had a community kitchen on another floor and everybody got together and ate together, or they didn't if they didn't want to. But that was a very effective community, a community initiative. They had doctors, they had healthcare, they had dental. They even had, they even had a program where if the um, paramedics were called and found somebody who was uh, down because of a drug overdose, they were able to go ahead and start initiate treatment immediately right there on the spot. And they, they did that just as a community. In Austin, I'm gonna brag about Austin a little bit, um, uh, a man named um, Nash is his last name. He started something called Mobile Loaves and Fishes. You may have heard about it. From that, he, he built up this service through donations where he was able to buy trucks, food trucks, that would go to where the homeless were congregating and he would feed them. So his entire, and, and it was all based on donations. From mobile loaves and fishes, he took it one step further and he built a community that's on the outskirts of Austin. And it is, I think it's, if I remember correctly, it's 150 acres. He's got another plot across the street of land that I think is a, another 100 plus acres. And then he's got another plot in another area of Austin that's probably another 100 acres. He has built tiny houses. He got the University of Texas at Austin, their architectural department, to design, to do a contest to design tiny houses. And then he got an organization, a company to uh, sell trailers, modular units, because, because the, the restrictions for putting in modular units are much less than building a house. But he's got this community that is fabulous. It's amazing, and anybody who is homeless is welcome to come. Now, they have to have a job. They have to get up and they have to go to work every day. And if they cannot function outside of the community, there are plenty of jobs within the community. They have a vegetable garden where, where they grow enough vegetables to feed everybody in that community. That community also has a restaurant where people 
like you and me can go and have and sit down at the restaurant. They have stores. They have they have um, a memorial garden where people who have died there have are are memorialized in that garden. They have children there. They have a playground. The children get picked up and taken to school. Um, but but there are very successful communities. Um, I don't know. You know, I don't know enough about Houston because I haven't done any work in Houston, but it's got to be very similar. Um, anybody can do those kinds of things. So, great question. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, sort of an observation that I like to just get your, your reaction to. You mentioned a need for theory. And I've had some you know, interaction with, with homeless, homeless people that I've known. Uh, one, of the, one of the starting points I would say is that sometimes what we think they need is not what they think they need. That's right. That's absolutely right. And, it, and it's like when I said, I give them a protein bar. I give them, you know, what they want is money. But if you work at a shelter, if you volunteer at a shelter, and the shelter is close to a liquor store, <laughs> you'll see the homeless in, in Austin. Let me backtrack. In Austin, in downtown Austin, there is a, a homeless shelter. And there are people outside of the whole homeless shelter all the time. They are not allowed in because they are on drugs. They are actively using. They cannot come in. So they're out on the streets, and they are, they are panhandling and still getting money. And as soon as they get enough money, they run right across the street to that liquor store, and they buy liquor. So I would want to give them something healthy. And if I don't have cash, then I try to always have something in my car that I can give them. Um, and, and if I were homeless, I'd have my dog with me because people will give to that dog before they'll give to that person. Um, I did a study, which brings me into another one. I, I did a study of the importance of companion because I learned with my first study, one of my, one of my participants talked about the need to have his dog when he was so sick, when he was so cold, when he was wet, when he was freezing outside, and his dog would lay right up next to him so that he could get the heat off of the dog. But I also saw that veteran many times very, very, very inebriated. And I saw that miniature schnauzer take that veteran home. He would actually he would actually start hiding from the veteran. The veteran would notice it, and then when he'd get the dog back on the leash, the dog would pull him home, and he would go back home. So companion animals are very very important. They're very important for women for, for protection. Um, and what I have found with companion animals, <coughs> excuse me, is that. Companion animals are at home anywhere. Animals are at home anywhere their person is. Companion animals don't know homelessness like humans know homelessness. For shelter, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to, I saw your hand. For, for shelter administrators who refuse to let people in because they have a companion animal, those people won't come in. If they cannot bring their animal, because that animal has stood by them, has been by them through thick and thin, who has never abandoned them. So it becomes a real issue when the police come along and start arresting people and immediately send their companion animals to, to a shelter. And then they have to get the, the companion animal vaccinated again because they've lost the records cost them $300 to get the dog out. And the, more, the longer the dog is in, is in the shelter, the more it costs. It becomes a horrible issue. But they will do whatever they need to do to get that animal out of there. And if you look at those animals, they are fed before the person is fed. Always. Always. So if you see somebody with a companion animal, give them some high quality dog food in their baggie. They'll be very happy to have that. Question. Oh, I, it's something I'm wondering. I don't know. Uh, how does it affect like the overall human dignity, worth, of feeling useful? 
like, I don't know, I called her all the time if I was homeless. I don't know, it just seemed like, at some point, at some point there should be, you have to be conscious of the, of the of human dignity, I would think. You do, you do, and just because they're homeless doesn't mean that they don't. They don't need that. And that's what I was talking about with the symbolic interactionism. They, some of the things that they complained about with going to see the doctor was, <laughs> was that if you have doctors, the VA hires doctors, foreign doctors, because they can. And so they, so the cultures, the culture differences might not dictate that you look a person in the eye when you talk to them. A veteran, a veteran wants you to stand toe to toe with them and look them in the eye and talk to them and tell them the truth, right? But if you have a doctor that does not make eye contact and who is and who is difficult to understand, these veterans fought for this country. They fought for us to speak English, and they don't always appreciate <coughs> a doctor they can't understand or a healthcare provider that they can't understand. And that goes along with the respect. And if they're homeless, they're going through a lot because they have lost a lot of respect. They get they get some of that respect back within their community where they look out for each other, they take care of each other. If one of them disappears for whatever reason, the whole group is worried and is looking for that person and making sure that back at the camp, their provisions are taken care of. Nobody goes in and picks apart their stuff and runs off with it. Um, so, so respect is, is very important. So when you, and you've got to be careful when you're working with when you're working with the homeless or when you're around the homeless. I was in Montreal, Canada in, in June with two nurse colleagues. We were at a conference and we happened to be going down the street that was bumper to bumper homeless people. And my friends said, Let, let's not go down the street. And I said, we're fine, we're fine. Nothing's gonna happen to us. And I said, just keep walking. And the people were, were hollering at us and talking to us, and I was hollering back, I was talking to them. But I've worked with enough homeless people to know when they're dangerous and when they're not. It's when I'm sitting at an intersection in Houston, which really happened to me one day. I was headed down to work at MD Anderson, and there was a man who had been in the intersection every day. I had gone by there every day. And one day, he, he was angry, and he came over and started bashing on the window of my car. I was the only person sitting there and I'm sitting at a red light and I'm thinking, do I just run this light? What do I do here? So you never know when, when you're going to come across somebody with some kind of mental illness and just try not to hurt them. God forbid that they hurt you in the process. So, but I think you, I think you see the signs, but respect, I mean, that's about the last thing they have, right? Before, and, and I, don't think about it because I'm, I'm very serious. You're only one major medical illness away from, from being homeless. I've already decided what my homeless plan is. I hope I'm never homeless, but I, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. I know where I'm going. Okay, it's a little bit of, be a little bit later of time. So please, uh, if you want to have questions, please go ahead and talk to the presenter in person. Uh, goes via 10 past uh, 7. So uh, thanks, and let's thank again the presenter. <laughs> and we'd like to give a gift, uh, just a little, little something, just a small.